Hello everyone and welcome back to Adobe Live. We're here for our last session um, in partnership with DNAD and we're wrapping up the year here on Adobe Live really. Um, it's our last week of streaming and it's been super nice to chat to all of you guys. And um, so yeah, welcome. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us. We're in for a treat because I'm joined by Benedict who's going to be chatting a little bit about his world. Um, Benedict, how are you? I'm very good, thank you much. It's really nice to be here. Thank you for having me on. Nice. I'm so excited. We had a little bit of a um, briefing session uh, last week and I'm not going to lie, I think we're actually going to run out of time this week um, and have a lot to talk about and run through. So I'm super excited to jump into the session. Um, I do want to say thank you to everyone because we're here for our last stream, um, but it's just been such a phenomenal year um, with all these guests and um, we're really ending on a high today. Um, stay tuned for Friday as well. We'll have a bit of a festive get together with everyone. You might see some faces you recognize. So um, full week of exciting and, you know, entertainment uh, streams for everyone. Um, but yeah, let's get started. Um, Benedict, we spoke week, as I said, but I think we're going to fill this hour pretty easily. Um, and I always do a little bit of digging around before <laughs> the streams, um, just, you know, doing my research. And I couldn't find anything embarrassing, so don't worry about <laughs> that. Um, but I noticed that your Instagram says, something's going to happen, something wonderful. And I think that is just the perfect way to start the stream and you know, forget a little bit about 2020 um, and start the new year. So take it away, introduce yourself. I know you have a presentation ready um, and you're gonna be talking a little bit about your world and some of your work as well. Brilliant. Yes, that that that, um, that quote's actually from two thousand and one. So um, yeah, it's um, hopefully something. Wow! Well, no way, yeah. it can be more relevant. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, meant to be for this year. <laughs> yes, <laughs> anything's better, right? <laughs> um, um, so yeah, so um, uh, ten years ago, um, I started on a project that I didn't think was going to take ten years. Um, I, I I wanted to start a project uh, with NASA. Um, so I, I contacted them, and uh, it was a it was a long road from there. Um, my my um, my earliest memory is um, um, is of being in a dark room. I was probably about one to two years old, and I uh, in the corner of the room was a black and white TV, and on that TV was uh, an image of men walking on the moon. And I think that has just sort of gone into my DNA. I mean, I know people's, it's subjective, right? What you can remember first, but that is genuinely the first thing I remember. And so um, from from there, I, I think it was kind of put into me that, that space was a sort of exciting thing. Um, weirdly enough, I mean, 42 years ago, yesterday, I think it was, um, we, uh, we, we celebrated um, the last man on the moon. So Gene Cernan, left the lunar surface 14th i think it was so the, today he would be flying around trying to catch up with the limb um but uh yeah it's it's i think that kind of that whole energy of of that very early memory is <coughs> is one that sort of moved through me and then when i was uh in my sort of early like 1981 april 12th 1981 was when the space shuttle program launched and i think that whole set of Growing up with those thoughts and growing up with the space shuttle era really um, set me as, as someone that would be into all those sort of engineering and space, um, and um, especially the shuttle, which was just to me was one of the most exciting programs that that was that was going. You know, when you're a kid at school and people talked about NASA, NASA was wasn't just an organisation. You know, it was people that worked at NASA were kind of godlike, or to me they were kind of godlike anyway. Um, and so it's always been something that's that's really um, uh, been a fundamental part of my life, really. 
I think just to interrupt a little bit, and we just mm. said this before the stream that I will be interrupting. <laughs> yes, do as Feel always. Free. Yes, I can waffle um, on. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's just it's my job, and I'll I'll bother you with questions all the time. I'm quite sure. curious. But um, yeah, I guess it's something that I, I also found from just, you know, your bio and, and looking around is, you know, you've had this interest for things that are maybe out of the norm or a bit extreme, whether that's, you know, and it's not just seen in this work particularly, but, you know, whether that's kind of technological or physical, can you tell us a little bit more about where that comes from for you and all this kind of drive and yeah. interest? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, you're, you're right. Absolutely. So, so technology, I, mean, I don't, I'm not a religious person or, you know, my beliefs are very much based on things to me that are tangible. I have a, 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 a sort of certain level of autism, as it were, I guess, where I, I, I need things to be sort of quite organized and I need things to, to understand and have a sort of physical reason behind them. And so I think um, the space program, engineering, medicine, science, all of these things to me are, are something that, that they offer, a, they're manifest, you know, they offer an answer. And not only that, they offer a, 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 an opportunity to learn something and then develop and change an opinion. You, you know, you have people that are working in labs, in physics labs, in, in you know, chemistry labs who are work on experiments for decades and at the end of it find out it didn't, it's not, it's not plausible or it doesn't work. And I, I've, I have massive respect for that and I have massive respect for the reasons for them doing it. So I think um, for me, it's about it's about um, something to believe in, you know, science, design, engineering, the space program particularly is, is, is something that I can wholeheartedly put my myself into and, and um, believe in what they're doing. Amazing. Like yeah, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions in the chat as well about that. Um, I think it's just fascinating interest for um, science, but also, I guess, things that are just unknown and unseen to many of us. And you'll see that in the work that you also um, shot and, and photographed. So, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it, it's once you're into something like that, I think it, it's very hard to not keep being positive about it, you know, because it, it, it's all if you look at all the space program, its fundamental basis is to be for the betterment of mankind, of humankind. You know, so everything it's doing is to learn. That's the whole point of the space program is so we can learn more and and uh, get more information, understand where we are in the universe uh, and, and understand more about our planet, who we are, why we're here, all the sort of really big fundamental questions. And ex space exploration is, you know, apart from death, it's the sort of greatest journey known known to man it's it's it, you know that there, there is so much that we have yet to uh, discover and but, do you feel um, you learned a lot yourself um through through photography this and being involved in this work um and that's part of also your personal i think i would have quite a selfish approach to it as well just wanting to grow my own knowledge through it well, yeah i mean i i think you know you, you would be foolish to not try and take in what you know any yes. experience i have at nasa i you, as I just said, you know, people to me that work at NASA are, are incredible individuals. And if I'm spending days with these people, it would be crazy to not try and get as much information as I can from them. Okay. Um, so I would go on these shoots and would come back and we'd be pretty exhausted actually by the time we came back because we were spending so much time with them taking in information and trying to learn about the, the artifacts and the objects that we were shooting at the same time. Um, not to mention the very early starts as well, because all these objects are photographed normally around five, four or five in the morning um, when a lot of the institutions are closed, unless we're actually in the NASA labs and then it's during the day. I yeah. didn't know about that. I have a lot of questions about, um, and we'll get there as well, but about the whole process of, you know, shooting and kind of your work and also the kind of post-production, right? Like editing and how you kind of went through that. So mm. yeah, excited to find out more. Cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, the, the um, exploration and design um, for the betterment of mankind, which is basically what we've just been talking about. I mean, it's, um, you know, the space program, as I've said, is, is it, it's there for us to, to, for all of us to enjoy and for anything that, that is, is the, every dollar that's spent on that comes back more to us, you know, because you're, 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 um, you're getting materials, you're getting scientific understanding. There's uh, um, uh, various techniques and things which are um, used in the space program, which are then filtered down into your everyday life. And so, um, and, and I think with the, you know, the missions themselves, you've got a deeper understanding of, of, 
dark matter, dark energy, black holes, all the questions that are really on people's at the sort of forefront of, of um, science at the moment uh, are being, well, they're not being sort of fully answered at the moment, but they're, they're, they're getting there with uh, sending up various telescopes and sending up uh, various probes to try and understand these questions. And so I think part of this project, as we were, you were just asking about, is you know the the knowledge that you uh, glean from each from each time I went to, to NASA or whether I was speaking to a technician or speaking to some of the sort of um, uh, astronauts as well, which was <laughs> quite a thing. Um, you you get to you get to learn more, and that's everyone in the street. All that information is available. You you only have to you know look at your clothing or look at what you're doing or go onto Google, and you all the things you can search for is there. So I think there are, you know, you look at materials, for example. So this with this lunar rover, you know, this was made of a special material so that when they launched it, it was light. Light's obviously not too, too much of a worry when you're on the moon, but it's pretty important when you're launching. You know, every pound that you put on top of the, of the rocket is, is a couple of hundred pounds of fuel. So um, there, there's all these kind of different things that people don't really realize are, are, are in their daily life that are there because of the space program. Um, and then, you know, you look at that, which is the sort of inside of the Orion capsule before it's got its uh, coating on. Similar kind of thing, you know, the technology they've got now is very much based on the Apollo technology they had. So shape of capsules is very similar, but it's a larger object now. The way it's built, though, is with new techniques, much more precisely, um, because they've got the ability to do that. The materials have changed because they've got better materials. So all of the understanding that goes into the previous uh, crafter, then you know it's, it goes up at the experiential rate really of the more knowledge we have the better we can make something the more efficient we can make it to even to the point where the possibility of you know you emma going into space in a couple of years time is quite something quite a viable thing you know if you've got a couple of million lying around in your back pocket or in that washing machine behind I you do. turns out great <laughs> <laughs> sounds good right <laughs> I was just checking this morning and we're perfectly on budget. <laughs> yeah, we're all good. Okay, good. That's good to know. Um, you know, it's it's that thing of, of um, we are developing at such a fast rate now. It's such an exciting time for the space program. When you've got people like Elon Musk who, are, you know, who have really pushed such a such an incredible rate of development um, simply because he's not tied, you know, NASA are tied by... Uh, government restrictions on how they do things they're a government funded organization so they have to answer to every single dollar whereas spacex uh, is owned by uh, an incredible man who has an incredible mind and also the, the ability and the will to move things forward at a rate where you know public testing of things is public testing of things he doesn't really care about what the public thinks just needs to get on with it and that is that's something to be admired i think in him and um yeah he's a Bit of a hero of mine actually i think at the moment i can um, hear that <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean look at what he's done you know just that starship the other day it's yeah. it's incredible yeah. the rate yeah. of development is incredible um, and you were just and, also talking a little bit about nasa and the kind of this protected space how was it for you to build that trust to be able to access all this and and shoot and you know be able to i guess it's a trust process as well that you're there to you know do good i guess or yes. um, deserve this you know access in some shape or form yeah it's definitely that it's um i mean i, I think it took as as this this next uh image says it's four and a half years to take one picture and and i think um there is that um there is that um uh, length of time where you know I went from the idea of oh, this is the project I want to do to actually taking a picture was um, was incredible and I, I I think it was that that they need to see what you're doing they need to understand that the time they're investing in you being there um, you know they they're trying to they're trying to explore space they're trying to build craft to explore space or they're trying to you know um, send up parts of the space station work on experiments train astronauts build craft that's these are important things so if i'm going in there to um say i want to kind of photograph your rockets and robots and it, like everyone else does then they needed a damn good reason um for them to invest their time so that took a long time for me to find out what it is we needed how we can make that work um and for them to start to understand what what i was doing as well so there was a lot of backing back and forth for a while but um 
eventually we we got the keys to um to uh houston so i i um they said look okay just just come up on one day this is we we going to let you work in the international space station trainer um so that's not something you turn down is it really i mean so um yeah. what me i just also love how you were like we got the keys i just kind of felt like, like that you know, I mean, <laughs> suddenly got someone at nasa going yeah okay come on let's, let's go um and um they did so my my uh, contact there uh, the wonderful dan hero who is um I, he's just an incredible guy um he and uh, met me and my assistant at the gate we we got taken in went through the whole pass procedure and our first day was we drove up to this sort of large concrete building which of which most of houston is um uh, uh, johnson is is um concrete sort of anonymous beautiful brutalist buildings um and we walked in and this is what we were greeted with was this incredible um sh view of so that's the space shuttle trainer at the end which is it's no longer there but was there when i started the project that's, that's how long ago it was um and um and then to the left is um the uh space station uh training mock-up so this is the mock-up facility in here they have mock-ups of everything so um past that point is um a rig that they use for uh anti-gravity simulations um and then there's various other bits and pieces in there there's the orion capsules in there as well there's a load of robonauts um and uh, later on i discovered there was uh bruce mccandless's um uh mmu pack the jet pack that he used to do his take his uh his um tetherless voyage on so there was some incredible stuff in there and that's your first day and you walk in and think oh oh my god uh, we are actually here now yeah um, and it takes a bit of a while to get in i don't think i don't think we actually really realized what we'd done until about three or four days until we'd actually got home back to london mm -hmm. um yeah so we we were in here photographing this was the very first shot we took which is the uh, inside of the columbus unit um and it just took a day to do the first couple of shots because we were spent most of it walking around chatting to them finding out what we should in be doing. wonder yeah um, and we had to take a break at one point actually because they one of these uh, i can't remember which astronaut it was was doing some training on um on uh, how to take pictures in space which i put my hand up to volunteer to train him but they they didn't they weren't interested but um <laughs> 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 um, but uh, yeah, well, there's people that have been into space that could probably offer him a bit more practical <laughs> advice than me. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, it was on, great. Keep on so, trying. Um, <laughs> I, I was there with my Alpa camera, which is a, yeah. it's, a it's a metal framed camera that um, is very, very precise. It's a beautiful piece of engineering, but it takes a long time to move. You, you basically end up shooting pictures in quadrants. I've got a, a little graphic letter on to show you if I don't prattle on, which I'm prattling on. But um, that's all right. <laughs> it isn't um, to me. <laughs> I still find this fascinating. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we we spent the, the, the sort of day in in what well, actually two days inside here, um, looking at all the various pieces of the space station, which is, you know, it's an exact replica of the space station, minus the monitors. I just need to point this out. This this is like. Um, a new home that hasn't got any furniture in it. So if you were to Google um, International Space Station and you look inside, it doesn't look anything like this any longer. But if you were to get 10,000 computers, iPads, about 65,000 miles of cabling and a load of Velcro ties and just fling them in there, that's what the space station looks like pretty much. It's, um, it's a sort of organized chaos of experiments and laptops um I, I mean and cameras there's uh it's just incredible it's an incredible spot so um yeah i i, I would advise people to to um have a look through that if they can um so yeah day, two days in here and at the end of it we kind of came out thinking my god those people really they really do earn their keep because that is it's a very strange environment if you imagine being sort of locked inside a porter cabin with, um, you know, just just uh, strip lights in there and um, sort of strangish air um, and nastyish pressure. That's that's what they've got. 
um, and there's seven of them up there at the moment. So um, yeah, it's I imagine it's pretty tight, tight. But they, I mean, they kept working the whole time. They're on such a tight schedule of you know you get up at this time, and then they're told to have an, they're told to do this experiment, and then they should be doing this. Then they're told when to have some water. Which water did they drink? Did they drink at a water cart on A one or B one? How much did they drink? When they go to the loo, how much did they go to the loo? <laughs> it's a, it's a pretty yeah. regulated life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, so so um, the the project really has has um, its its sort of fundamental beliefs are in a couple of things really. Um, there's the part of, of of me that absolutely loves utilitarian design. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of of form following function. So, um, you know, everything designed in the space program, um, anything sort of with a strong engineering background is normally utilitarian. It's, it's you know, the reason for a jet engine or looks the way a jet engine does is because those blades in the jet engine have to sit at that angle. They have to be made of a certain material. They have to fit in a certain way. And they, there has to be, you know, a repetition of them to, to move the air through. So if you if you look at a, a jet engine as, as something that's not only functional, but it's actually really beautiful, then the, you can look at it through the space program as well. Everything in the space program is there because it has to be there. And there's nothing that's there that's superfluous because you can't afford the weight, you can't afford the space. So it, it's all um, that that kind of um, that that working belief system is something that I really um, hold deep to myself. Um, and then also there's the, um, hang on, sorry, I'm a little bit stuck. So there's the, that sort of follow through on, onto the, the spacesuit design. You know, that is not only a piece of design that is there because it's form following function, but it represents an object that's far greater than the sum of its parts. You know, a spacesuit is, it's a life support system for an astronaut but it's also a, a symbol for something that's far greater. It's a symbol for um, the kind of explorer or when I was a kid, you know, it's a hero. You, you look at a, an astronaut and they're a hero. They're someone that's going off into, into the wilderness that none of us, well, the majority of us are probably never going to get to see. They're going to experience things that we don't get to see, experience. And they're going to do it for, not just for them, but they're doing it because they want to enhance our lives. They want to bring a better understanding of what's going on. Um, and I'm sure there's selfish reasons too, right? Because who wouldn't want to be an astronaut? But it, it, it's it's there for the betterment of mankind again. It's that thing that I keep saying, which is all of this is there for that. Um, and the object itself, the spacesuit itself, has this kind of iconic um positioning to me and i know that word's thrown around a lot but to me they are an icon they when um when pilgrims would go to see a cathedral for the first time you know they must have been blown away when they when they walked into that building and there were these stained glass windows with you know their their deities or their gods or their or or whatever inside then this is this to me is a similar kind of thing this represents far more than that this represents uh, a a level of humanity that is it says we are able to overcome all of our issues we are able to sort of go into environments that are are you know unbearable for, to us as a human but we can then build this which makes it bearable we can explore worlds and go further than we we can't count on this planet um and so I think it's that that level of design that it takes it from a suit where it's just a suit on its own and it's also the astronaut. It's the two things together. So when you think of when you think of an astronaut, people tend to think of a spacesuit. They don't they don't tend to think of the person. They tend to think of the spacesuit. When you think of a spacesuit, then you sort of think of the astronaut as well. You know, and it's those those you combine the two. So t together, they they're greater than the one thing. And then without each other, they can't function in that environment. So I, I think oh, there's really, so much that's yeah. represented in this. You know. Completely. There's so many layers to this. I really like that. Um, you also mentioned religion earlier on, and it's many times I've read your work that you describe as this kind of religious experience and mm. in the way you treat it. And also, the other thing that really you know strikes me is that you're giving so much humanity to all of this work and these objects and machines, but without any 
human involved. Um, so it's crazy to see how much life these objects have. But it's almost like we're allowed to have this imagination as a viewer and you're just kind of nudging this. And I can completely imagine this whole story about the space suit and the astronaut and all of that, which is, I think, really poetic in a way. Thank you. Yes. I mean, that is it, it, it's it's something that gets um, mentioned about my work quite a lot where it, uh, pe people say about it being calm and quiet. And I think that's. Mm -hmm. This is very much an important. This is a very, very important thing in this project, especially. Um, so the, the 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 objects are removed from their locations, from their backgrounds, so that you can really concentrate on that. And then they have they they tend to have um, a, a, the opportunity for the viewer to then really soak in the object. You know, it, it's it it is that thing of i want people to have that quiet contemplation which there, there are so many mixtures with religion here that um i sometimes wonder whether i am <laughs> just because the way i talk about these things is on this level and maybe this is maybe this is my you know science and 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 engineering and and design are my belief system really and i i guess I believe in it so much that i'm trying to put it out there for other people to get a little snapshot of that and try and soak it in themselves um yeah it's it's it does get spoken about i've had a few people actually say that they were crying when they saw some work which was that's amazing yeah, yeah I, I, I i it's not a reaction i'd ever expected to hear i was worried at first they were crying because it was so <laughs> awful but, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. and you're just hoping that feedback would never get back to you <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> finally someone cried <laughs> Terrible work. I'm sorry, um, but um, yeah, no, I, they they were genuinely. They were just. They said they were really moved. It was. It was. It was quite. Um, I think when when you have this, when you have a, t a time to not have any inside outside influence, you know, when there's nothing there to detract or or to or you know be bombarded by information, which is what happens a lot. Um, I think a lot of people's work today tends to be fast and and, and brash and in your face, and I. I think there's so much of that going on in our day-to-day -day lives. It's nice to step away and just have the opportunity to stop. Don't think about anything else, but just look at the work and, and try and resonate with it. You know, I mean, I, I don't mind what the reaction is. You know, if you don't like it, then that's great. If you do like it, that's great too. But it, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't really matter. But I think just a chance for you to stop and, and, and soak something in, in your own time and at your own pace is, is a, a really really important part of what I do. There's other projects I've shot which have the same thing. I, I, I did a project where I shot a load of very, very, very minimalist skies and clouds. And um, that was all about that. I made these very large prints up and they were just an opportunity to really switch off. And I think even in the films I make, they, they, sh they are very quiet and uh, the pace of them is very slow. There's not sort of fast cuts all the time. So I think that's pretty much what I, the kind of person I am and I try and push that through on each of my projects really. Mm -hmm. No, that's wonderful. How will um, you go move along because I know you have a lot to show. Yeah, listen, I have got a feeling we're not gonna get through it, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. I think we've, we've sort of we've, we've we've touched on things anyway, so it's all it's all good. good. I can just flip through really fast like a flip book. Um, yeah. um <laughs> So uh, this was so um, talking about going into buildings where um, we would we would sort of see one thing and then see something other. Um, this this is um, the an Apollo bubble helmet, which is one of the helmets they wore uh, when they were when the Apollo crews were launching. And um, I was walking, going from the crew survival lab to another building, and we walked past a glass cabinet. And in the glass cabinet was this this helmet, along with some other helmets and gloves and bits and pieces. Um, and inside the helmet were all these rubber stamps, which were all rubber stamps that were made by um, that were made for all the Apollo crews to stamp their suits and their gloves. And I, I mean, I couldn't believe what it was. I thought it was a bit of a joke at first. But um, uh, I, I asked one of the um, engineers if we can if we could possibly photograph them, thinking they were just going to say, "You're joking," you know, this is all this is all really important stuff. <laughs> And I said, yeah, of course, absolutely. So we set ourselves up to photograph one of the new um, EMU suit helmets. And while we were doing that, um, they came back and said, oh, we're really sorry, the cabinet's locked. And the guy that's locked the keys in it is left about five years ago. <laughs> so they um, they then set about breaking in, which was brilliant. Um, so <laughs> they broke into the cabinet for me and um, we got the stamps out. And this is another thing about the power of the object here 
you know, these we look at a spacesuit, and that has that is an obviously important item, right? That's the, one of the most exciting things I think we can see. And then you go down to this, which is, you know, it's a it's a, a, a bubble helmet with some stamps in, with an individual stamp, right? That is just a, a normal rubber stamp made by Franklin Rubber Stamp Company of Delaware, who happened to be in the same state as ILC Dover, um, who make the spacesuits. So when ILC Dover were making the spacesuits for the Apollo program, they needed some stamps made up um, to, to, to stamp the suits. So they went to a Franklin Rubber Stamp Company and, you know, every once in a while they'd say, oh, can you make a stamp for a guy called Armstrong and Lovell and Cernan? And so they did, probably not having a clue what they were making. Um, for a guy. <laughs> yeah, and now, you know, there's this rubber stamp, right? This now turns yeah. from an object of total insignificance to something of massive significance in the 20th century history. Um, and I think it's it's those things that I love. I, mean, I, I think objects are... Objects have a significance to the people who are aware of its history and the importance of that object. So if, if I was to show this to someone that didn't have a clue who Neil Armstrong was and they didn't really care about the space mm -hmm. program, they'd be like, nah. but to me and to other people like me um, um, or to people that really care about um, this kind of thing, I think it suddenly has this power. Um, yeah, you're elevating I, the value of it with a story, right? And it's yeah. so much better than just functionality about it. But, it's, you know, of yeah. course, I can totally see it now with the stamp story that it could just be seen as completely, you know, it is what it is. But, mm. um, yeah, I just like that actually you, you're, you you know, you can also add the story through your work um, and this can be seen differently by someone else completely. And this is what maybe some art as well is seen, you know, it's interpreted differently, but there's a story to this and this might bring different memories to different people as well and different moments in time. I think it does. I think there's, yeah, there's been a lot of engineers who um, from the uh, space shuttle program actually, um, who have got in touch with me just saying they've, they've bought a copy of the book and they've, oh, wow. um, they've, they've seen, you know, some of the work and they really, mm -hmm. it reminds them, you know, it brings back certain memories, but it also just the way they talk about, I'm able to show elements of the shuttle or elements of the engineering that they, wanted to try they try to describe to people but um they'd never been able to and now I, the book kind of does that mm -hmm. and i think also that there's another thing about these things which is um so the, the original intention for the project uh, really wasn't to make a book um the the, the book was originally just going to be a catalog to accompany the exhibition <laughs> that escalated <laughs> Oh God, <laughs> it really is sort of just escalated really. Um, but um, the, 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 you know, the original plan was to, was to shoot all these items in very high resolution so that I, I could then make large prints. So the, these rubber stamps are, uh, are five foot by four foot across, so 1.2 by 1.5 meters across when they're printed up. Um, and then, um, and the suit will be like six foot 11, or what's that, two and a bit meters. Um, uh, on a, a nine foot sheet, so sort of two, three meters or something like that. So they'll be very large scale objects so that when you when you see the, the space suits, for example, they'll be elevated up. So you will look up to them with this kind of back to the religious symbolism, really. But, you know, that kind of it's sort of like a deity almost that, that's above you. And um, you can sort of soak in the, the the wonder of the suit and what it represents. And it's the same with the stamps, you know, any objects like some of the lunar rocks as well are printed uh, a very large scale. Um, and to me, that's an important element of, of people understanding the significance of each object. I don't really want to, nothing should be small in this project because to me, everything is huge, <laughs> literally. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's, um, so the, there were some other objects in that case. So this was, this was one of the, um, uh, 80s launch helmets from the space shuttle era. This they used these up until STS 51 Challenger disaster. Um, I think that's right. I might be wrong on my dates or my my numbers, but um, uh, yeah, this was uh, it's a sort of flip top lid helmet, which is pretty cool, but no pressurization or or, or anything in there. So this was another one of the the kind of cool items that was in this cabinet that I I just started. Gene Cernan's glove. So last man on the moon. Um, Albin, all these the incredible names. Um, and then going back to the sort of talk about design really is, and functionality is, you know, that to me represents such an incredible piece of design. That's one of the um, 
engines on the Saturn V and there's all the plumbing and bits and pieces and, you know, but everything there again is designed to move air across, to cool, to force uh, gases in at certain times. And it's, um, it's, it's just such a perfect example of that utilitarian design that we were talking about earlier on, um, you know, and it, it, the other thing that you get with all these items that have been into space is the sort of wear and tear marks, which are absolutely beautiful. You know, you look at the tiles on the, the, the thermal protection system on the front of a, a shuttle nose and it's, you know, it's a thing of beauty. And again, all those tiles are there arranged in that space in that way, because they have to, that's how they have to be. Um, and it, it's just this, incredible level of sort of crazy paving with very expensive crazy paving. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful piece of design. Um, so I, I, I think we were talking earlier on about the, um, uh, the sort of ethos of the project and, and part of, of what I want people to do in the way the images are, are constructed and the way that they're removed from their environment is, is it gives people a chance to, to look at something in a fresh way. So when um, astronauts go into into space, they have, they are they are subject to a, a thing when they see Earth for the first time. I think called the overview effect, which is um, it's it's uh, 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 what would it be? It's kind of like a, a change in perspective. Really, it's a chance for them. They they see the planet as this this ball in space with a very very thin atmosphere. And you're seeing it as as one entity. So there's no you know there's no borders. There's no division of people or, or political borders or color or race. It's just one planet with one group of people on. And so they suddenly have this change in the way that they see the earth and it makes them care about the planet more. I think all of them say if everyone could get up and go and see the, the, the earth from space, we would treat the planet in a different way because you'd have a, such a great respect for who we are, what we're doing. You know, we're this. We are insignificant dots on an insignificant dot in a much greater universe. Um, and I think if you suddenly see yourselves like that, you realize how fragile everything is. Um, so I, I, I kind of want to, it's a, it's a bold claim, right? To say, I want people to have a view of my work in the same way, but it's, I want people to have a view of it in a different perspective. So that's why, um, the backgrounds are, are or the locations are removed and anything that's sort of superfluous to the design is removed so people can really have that chance that opportunity to to, to view it in a different way and maybe take something else from it than they previously thought uh, so you know images like this where it, it it really makes you see a completely different view of the shuttle right you know you're no longer you looking at it as the space shuttle you're looking at it as, a, as more of a uh, a, a piece of design and just the tail part and the, and the uh, reaction engines and the main engines and it's that chance to see it in a slightly different way and then to look at objects like this which is you know it's the simplicity of a uh, the inside of, of one of the current EMU helmets so this is the kind of liner part of it without the gold visor and the cameras and the, all the wonderful bits that make it glitzy and gold this is the functional part um, and to me that's just got such a, a, a sense of calm beauty to it that um yeah when they when they asked me if i wanted to shoot this it was it was just another thing you know where there's a list as long as my arm of things i'd love to go back you're like i'll shoot yeah. anything <laughs> just, yeah. just bring yeah. everything yeah, everything you've got <laughs> yeah, just have the lot thank you very much um, yes, was there so anything you wish you could have seen or you you know uh, didn't get to shoot or <laughs> um, <laughs> <Trick> question <laughs> well so they they um when I started the project, the idea was to to finish it in 2018 because that was the original date for them to launch um, the Orion program, which is now the Artemis program with the Orion capsule. Um, but that's obviously been delayed and delayed and pushed back through various um, issues with engineering and and and, and budgets and, and everything else that goes with a building a you know a whole new space program so um i would love to have i would love to shoot the launch of artemis that would be wonderful um and there's plenty of other objects i wanted to do more in the neutral buoyancy lab where they um, i wanted to film a photograph inside the neutral buoyancy lab so in the pool with them when they're um when they're working on their um 
mission practice. So they, they, it's a very large swimming pool, um, very, very large swimming pool. And they, uh, the astronauts wear their spacesuits, go into the water, and then they, they can practice on, on various missions if they're doing EVAs. So I'd love to get in there with them doing that. Um, there's quite a few things so that, you know, I think Orion capsule was still being built. The Boeing Starline capsule was still being built. So I'd love to go and shoot those. Um, the testing, drop testing, I, I, I mean, all of it. <laughs> the list never ends. I was the lifts, <laughs> yeah, it, it, wow. it does end. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, you go from a helmet, right, to this, which is, you know, probably the largest thing apart from the Saturn V, really, um, that we I photographed in the project. So this this was um, the shuttle carrying aircraft, which was uh, an, was an American Airlines Boeing seven four seven, and then they they kind of um, uh, took it and. With the help of an engineer, they designed the program that, that they could make this into something that could move the shuttle around. So once they landed at Edwards and they needed to bring it back to Kennedy, they had a, a, a rig there where the, the shuttle would be, would be lifted and turned and dropped back down onto, uh, well, not dropped, placed on top of the, uh, <laughs> just drop it. Many um, would be offended. <laughs> it's absolutely fine. We don't It'll drop things. <laughs> just drop it then. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, so uh, there, there's um, they, they would sort of lower it and place it onto the uh, on the top of the 747. And this, you know, there are amazing photographs from the 80s of this thing flying over America, uh, shot from the top and shot from underneath. And it's just to me, it's it's I don't know. You've got this kind of technology that everyone's available to, you know, with a Boeing 747 with this st stuck on top of it. Um, and it, it's just I don't know. It really, to me, it really sort of pushes that dream of like, this is, look at what we're doing. We're flying this over you. This is what, this is what we're going to do. Um, it, it really was that sort of total understanding of an exciting time. Um, I mean, even I think, you know, now is an exciting time in, in um, space exploration, but, but then I think there was that mix of your regular jet and this on top of it is pretty, pretty bloody cool. And we have a question in the chat, um, you know, a lot of people are really fascinated by this, but um, we had Sean who was asking a bit about, you know, the interest in this whole kind of more cultural interest in space um, and asking about the connection people have with the history of space and whether that's kind of more a uh, US based, you know, passion or you can see this in Europe as well and, and just the general kind of, you know, um, demand for this and wh what kind of traction did you see? Did you see that, you know, most people interested in the book were based somewhere in the world or or there's a kind of, uh, this is kind of, you know, condensed anywhere out there. Um, what is the kind of situation with interest in space? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's a good question, actually, because that was something that, um, weirdly enough, hadn't hadn't crossed my mind at all when I, when mm. I started the project was, you know, who's going to be interested in it? Yeah. Um, it, it was more that I just wanted to do it. And then I, I think there's there's obviously um, a very big following in America because it's, you know, this is NASA, right? So that's an American organization. But I think the thing about NASA and the thing about the Apollo missions and the moon landings was something they didn't expect was when the Apollo astronauts came back from landing on the moon, they did a world tour and nobody in, in, in when they were into Germany or India or wherever they went, Nobody said, oh, you know, America's done it. They said, we've done it. Well done, we've done it. You've done it for us. And I think um, space is one of those areas that um, can be a unifier for the world. You know, it has that opportunity. The space station is called the International Space Station. Um, and so you've got, you know, you have Russian cosmonauts in there. You have Japanese astronauts. Astronauts, you have European um, astronauts, you have Canadian astronauts, and, and North America, and so you have all these different nations coming together. And I think the book and the project has that universal appeal, which is wonderful. You know, I mean, I really genuinely love. I've I've had books sent all over the world, and um, it it's it's really nice to hear the messages I get from all the different nations, from um, from people who have had some sort of connection in some way um so i don't think there's necessarily one thing america is definitely one of the leading areas but i, I think there are other you know europe is definitely up there as well i like that you use the word universal because i think this is something that we can all relate a little bit to if you're you know interested and have some kind of memory to you know space or watching this i think this is 
it it awakes a, a child, inner child in all of us, um, and definitely as well. So I hope that answers the question in the chat. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think that is that it it is that thing of you know people. Someone was saying to me the other day that it's you know space is it's it's a, it's a space race, right? So the, the, there's mm -hmm. there's obviously a gain to be made in certain areas, and there's obviously certain things that people want to do before somebody else, and which is true, you know. I mean, I guess you know, first man on the moon, first spacewalk, first person to get to Mars. They're talking about you know building the the lunar gateway, which is a, a an orbiting um, station which will go around the moon and uh, will stay there, which will be used for. Um, for um, uh, mining on the south pole of the moon, so there's there's quite a few things that um, you know that are, that are going on, which will be, I think, I guess, sort of commercially interesting. But there's also that thing where you've got um, uh, an appeal for everyone to try and do it because people know that they we need to you know we need to be careful about where we live. We need to be careful about where we're going. The, the the lengths of breadth that they go to when they're sending a probe to Mars is pretty incredible. You know, the clean room, the lengths of, you know, biology that you don't want to be taking with you to Mars to infect something. It's it's um it's quite um I would say uh there is an appeal for the planet to get behind everything. There's obviously a commercial element to everything as well now, but I think people still have at heart they want to make sure that we are all doing it in the right way with the right belief system behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so I was going to talk a little bit about how the, some of the images were made. People often ask me about mm -hmm. how, how these things were, were, were made. Yeah. And um, there's uh, when you look at um, uh, that, there's, there's a, an image of um, the, the space shuttle Atlantis engines that I, I shot. And that has, um, that has got a, uh, it's shot in four elements. We were talking earlier on about the, the, the shots inside the space station and they were um, they were constructed in the same way. So the camera that I used on these was this Alpa camera and it, it allows you to move the digital back left, right, up, down. And we would then shoot the elements um, from of the picture front to back. So you do a thing called focus stacking. So you ensure the whole thing is, is, um, is focused all the way through. Um, and so with the space shuttle engines, that was done in four quadrants. Uh, and I've got a little uh, visual here of, I don't know whether that's picking that up, but um, is that on screen, Tim, or is that there? Yeah. Anyway, there's, um, um, can you see that on your screen? I don't know if you've got Still, there. Still waiting. I think Tim's going to put it up on the screen. Otherwise, it's just for me. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> this has become a private show. <laughs> Um, so, um, so yes, so there's, uh, they're, they're basically <laughs> you shoot the top left and top right of the screen, and then bottom left and bottom right of the of the object. Sorry, not screen. Um, and then we would focus stack front to back, and we would stick all those stacks together. And then we would um, we would also then uh, put the four quadrants together as well, and those would be um, then generated into one image. Uh, so that was I think there were about sixty images to make up that one image. So it's quite a high resolution. And again, it was the idea that that should all be something that um, has a, uh, a, a the ability for me to make very, very large scale prints, um, which um, is the purpose of the of the project uh, was again, was this exhibition rather than just the book. Um, so the book, as I said, it was such a surprise. I mean, I, it was a really originally just going to be this um, this um, uh, catalog to accompany the exhibition and then the more I shot throughout the project and the more I got um, into sort of laying things out and designing them I, my, my background is was graphic design so I'm kind of into how things <laughs> should look I did know, read was, about this as yeah. well I was like fascinated <laughs> by how you just got into photography and, and explaining this clean like approach yeah I, I think there's, yeah. A, there's a technical element to things that I love uh -huh. and there's, uh, and there's also a sort of a symmetry that pleases me. I think it's part of that whole thing of the way, just the way my mind works, the way my I see things and the sort of resonate with me. There, there's a sort of things have to have a certain functionality and a certain order for the, for me to make sense of it. Um, and so this is this sort of technical element to the photography and then starting to lay them out into um, a, a project just so that I could see where everything was. And the more I did, the more I started laying them out, the more I started to realize actually this, 
this catalog is actually going to be quite a big catalog, so, <laughs> um, which, you know, ended up as a, a five kilogram, 350 page book, um, which is been described by some um, couriers as a little bit too heavy. Um, <laughs> not at all. And actually, did you think all. a bit about like um, format as well and question that and how, you know, was there an exhibition as well or any, I think, you know, and any aim to make this bigger or to, you know, showcase this beyond the book, because I guess this kind of grew, right? As you said, it escalated in, in a joking way, but really, yeah. was there legs for it to become bigger or is there still that um, when you look back on it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, as I said, it was, it was, it, its birth was an exhibition, right? That's mm -hmm. the, the fundamental yeah. part of this was it was always going to be That's right, yeah, thrown yeah. on a very large scale in a in a place that can afford to allow the work to breathe. You know, there's no point in having huge pictures right next to each other. You need a lot yeah. of space to have them in. So, like this one here of the um, of the nose of Atlantis. You know, that was shot in four parts, three parts, um, and that the idea of that is to sort of make a sort of 15 foot high print so that it would be at the end of a corridor. You would walk down yeah. and have this enormous shuttle illuminated in front of you um so yes there were there were there have been a couple of different iterations of the of the project to be an exhibition um and yeah. at the moment i'm speaking to somebody else as well about how we can make that work because it, it comes it pretty much comes down to scale scale and um and the moment you do scale something up like this it's quite expensive to make so i, I need bet. to find, <laughs> find people to help pay for the project um really yeah it's um but, no, it would... but it, it's i think it's one way to really experience the work that's different right than just in, in a book and and um yeah not that i think the book is such a great way to make it accessible mm. um and i just love that you know it's it kind of elevated you know this work that is very unseen to many and you know being able to be exposed to that and i think so many of us have dreamt to see this but um yeah, I think the, the exhibition and kind of real life aspect gives it even more impact sometimes um, to, yeah. to see it on this scale. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's that thing of, um, you know, when you when you see a digital image, it's, it's one thing. But when you see when I saw them in print on the book for the first time, that was amazing. You know, that really was something um, that I wasn't expecting, actually, to, to have the, the kind of reaction of like, wow, these are even more detailed in print form. And I think when you see them as um, as large scale prints, it's even more so. I've, I've, I, there's a few collectors who have had um, photographic prints made up of the uh, engine shots and Apollo and um, the Armstrong stamp, and they've had sort of five foot by four foot prints. Somebody else has had a, a nine foot um, spacesuit print a couple of them and they are they are impressive um and i don't often say that about my own work <laughs> but it is you know when you see it in, in front of you and it has this this incredible presence it really does dominate and um and stand out um there's some collectors who've got the interiors of the space station imagery as well and it's the same thing it it's you know it's a striking it's a striking image um and i think that um once the exhibition is seen by the public. I think that you will get a much better sense of the work, and I think it will really start to resonate with people. I, I, I have a very, very strong belief in this project, and I have a very strong belief in this work being exhibited in the right way, in the right place for people to get access to it, but also to see it at scale. That's the most important thing. It's, it's definitely mm -hmm. a, a, a strength here. Yeah, this is so. This was the Saturn V engines, or these are the Saturn V engines. Um, this was uh, this was shot inside the the um, exhibit area where they have the Saturn V rocket at, at uh, Johnson Space Center. It's an enormous building. It's an enormous rocket, and these are enormous things themselves. That's um, oh, are they twelve foot? I think from something like that across. So um, you can fit an aircraft inside each of those engines. You can fit a private jet inside one of those. Um, it's crazy. It's incredible, right? <laughs> so you, well, I was standing there photographing it, and you would watch people come into the building. They would walk in normally, open the if they were on their own, they'd walk in, open the door, and their jaws would just sort of be sagging down, and they're standing there going, "Oh my god!" And then, but if they were with a group, they would walk in, stop, turn around, go back out, walk in with the group in backwards, and then going, "I told you, see, I told you, see, I told you," and it was <laughs> it's just this incredible reaction of. There's normally a few expletives in there as well, but um, it, 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 it's such an incredible object that um, I, I, I think you can't help 
being sort of overawed by the general scale of it when you see it in person. And I think the plan for this, again, this was shot in, in various sections, would be to do, would be to make another sort of like 10, 15 foot size print across so that people could start to get a better understanding of how that works. Um, so one of the, when we were in the, um, the vehicle mock-up facility, there was um, Bruce McCandless's jetpack was at the, at the back, the um, MMU. Um, and this is that, that famous shot of him floating in space, untethered. He was, you know, the highest man, the highest earthling um, in space. There was no one above him. Uh, and he was the furthest man from Earth at the time because the space shuttle was was behind, behind um, uh, was back out of the camera. And, and that was... That was, you know, just the most incredibly brave thing to have. This guy sitting there floating in space uh, with, a, with a pack that he helped develop. That's why he got the sort of first, first experience of it. Um, and I, I, there, are, there are pieces of equipment that, you know, I associate with certain things. And that, that MMU, when I saw it inside the, the vehicle mock-up facility, I knew I just had to, that was one of the things I had to, had to, had to shoot. Mm -hmm. Um, so they, um, they, again, it was one of those things that, where they were like, yes, you can off, you go off and do that. He, he just look at that By shot that point, they're just, just used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it was sort of moved around. This is, this is pack number one. So this is one of the ones that they used for, uh, for training. Um, two and three were used in space and then brought back. But, um, yeah, people think of him, you know, there's that lovely shot of him floating and you think, oh, it must be so peaceful, right? He's contemplating life and just looking at the earth but actually what was going on was he was really cold <laughs> he was freezing cold <laughs> and he had uh houston um on uh comms to him asking him don't go around the back of the shuttle mind the engines be very careful um tell us all your readings give us a check on your air tell us all your or your you know what's your temperature what you're doing is the pressure okay how's the pack working and then also he had the people in the shuttle going hurry up hurry up come back because we we want to have a go um so <laughs> It was, um, it's, it's not as peaceful as you think. I think a lot of these things aren't really, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, it, another incredible bit of kit that I hadn't planned on shooting because I didn't know it was available, um, but you know, was later there. So um, that's again, one of my, one of the objects I will be um, um, uh, basically accruing for my own pri private collection when NASA donate them to me. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, along with this, uh, which is one of the lunar um, Hasselblads. So this was um, this was a camera that was used by all of the Apollo crews to train on well, before they went off to the moon. Um, so they could get an idea of how to work the camera. They would take pictures, work out what the settings are, and, and just learn how those things work. Because you know they're astronauts; they're not photographers, so they have to learn a bit like that crew were doing in the space station when I was there. Um, so this was. This was put next to me on a table while I was photographing the Z2 spacesuit. One of the crew survival engineers who I'd been with the day before photographing the new Z2 suit um, came, uh, sorry, photographing the stamps that I was there before the, the day before. He came down just to check how we were doing. That's kind of how those NASA guys are. They're really nice. <laughs> and put this on the table next to me while I was shooting and I saw it out the corner of my eye and couldn't, couldn't believe what it was. And they let me open it up. And there on the back plate, there are those little crosshairs that you can see, which are sort of ubiquitous with all the, the shots of the, um, the lunar um, pictures of showing the landscape. They're, they're there for scale and depth um, to give a reference. But just seeing those, I mean, yeah, kind of blew me away a little bit. I yeah. think that's the nearest I've come to, to sort of crying. My assistant. I was going to say, it's oh crying yourself. <laughs> Are you okay? And I was like, yeah. Are you <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's so nice to hear. <laughs> yeah, and this was so. This is uh, this is the the lunar um, lunar sample uh, lab. So this is this is actually in the vault of the lunar sample lab. So they have the lunar lab where you go in. You know, everything's you have to wear a sort of a monkey suit, and you, you go in and you you. you um, they've got the samples which they work on are in um, glass cases and you have to wear these gloves to go into the glass case. And But these are all unopened samples. So these are all pieces that were brought back um, and have just remained in their stainless steel cases uh, sealed in, um, I think it's hydrogen. Uh, or is it helium? I can't remember. But um, yeah, they are sealed and waiting to be opened. Um, 
there was a story that some interns worked at uh, the lab for a while in the summer um, a few years ago, and they managed to steal some, they blew up the safe, which had their notebooks in, and stole some rock, and then tried to sell the rocks online. Um, you know, lunar rock's quite expensive thing to get because you've got to get to the moon. So it was, um, <laughs> it wasn't the brightest idea, but they, uh, they, they thought they'd teamed up with these guys to, uh, to sell the rocks to. They met at a hotel and then went to, uh, another bar to sell it to them. And just as they're about to do the deal, every single person in the bar stood up because they were all FBI. So that don't, don't go trying to sell lunar rocks, kids. It's not a, not a good <laughs> idea. Um, and in, in another item that I'd like to have in my collection, really. Um, so this is uh, Ed White's uh, training suit. So Ed White was um, a real kind of hero of mine. He he um, made the very first American spacewalk. Um, Alexei Leonov made the very first spacewalk uh, with the Russians, but he uh, Ed White did the second, first for America, and his was the longest, actually. It was 23 minutes. Uh, he flew from... Was it Hawaii to Florida was the distance he made? Uh, 17 and a half thousand mile an hour going across in his, wow. his Gemini craft. So when he opened up the hatch, he was the sort of first man to make a bit of space debris. He opened his hatch up to get out and a glove that he had, a spare glove floated off and out into, into space. Oh. Um, but yeah, he was unfortunately later killed in the Apollo one fire when, um, yeah, when they had that horrific fire inside the, the capsule. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, total, another dude um yeah good good man um, and then more sort of experience stories are amazing yeah how actually do you find all these stories like who passed on all this knowledge and i know you have this huge self-interest right like in in researching and reading but was there you know a whole experience as well when you shot to you know for the people around you who were also able to give a little bit more of that background and context to some of these objects yes yes i i, th I think um I mean, as you can tell, I'm a, I'm kind of a bit of a sort of space geek as well. So, you know, I, I know a lot of must come from you, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've learned some new um, things along the way. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's it's accumulated knowledge um, just through um, th you know through working on the project and uh, researching what was going on, um, looking at why things were certain certain ways, you know, how things were changed. And then, you know, moments like that, the first space war, I, I, I just think that's such an incredibly brave thing to do. You know, you're, you're basically launched in, Mercury wasn't, that, sorry, Gemini craft wasn't much bigger than Mercury craft in terms of overall space inside. And it was, you know, it's a very thin alloy metal they've got on the outside. It's, um, and then you are opening up something and getting into an atmosphere that's really not friendly to you you know this is you're going to die if, if without this suit so um I, I just think it's incredible he had this little pack uh, this little um like a little jet maneuvering kit which was um designed to help him maneuver around the air run out in that very quickly so he was just tethered after a while um and he floated around there and he said it was the the happiest and saddest day of his life it was the happiest day when he got out and then mission control had to tell they they were pretty stern with him after a while they had to tell him to get back in because he didn't want to go back in and he just said this is the saddest moment of my life <laughs> and went back in poor fella but um yeah what a, what a, what a guy but uh, you know I, I seeing things like that and then seeing the interior of this of the space shuttle trainer the, you know these are as I said, when I started, there were things I definitely wanted to shoot. And then the more trust I built up with all the people, they started showing me other objects and saying, well, you know, do you want to, do you want to come and see this? Well, would you know that we've got this? And it, every single day, I think I just had a, a bit like Ed White, right? You would have these days where you're like, this is the best day of my life. And then when you're yeah. leaving, you're like, this is the saddest day of my life. <laughs> it was that continuous thing, you know, that's, Maybe a bit of Ed living in me there. God, I, I would be happy about that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was glorious, you know, to see this stuff, to know all the crews have trained in there, to 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 look at the technology that was available and understand, you know, what it meant to people. This is it, it's just the most incredible pieces of engineering, um, and I I am extremely lucky to have seen it all. Um, and I'm extremely lucky to be able to to show it to everyone else, and hopefully they'll they'll sort of enjoy it too. Really, I mean this, you know. So that's wow. the inside of the vehicle assembly building where they build 
that's originally where the Apollo rockets were built, and then it's where the um, uh, space shuttle program was based. So they would they would bring a shuttle in there, and lift it on a crane, so it would tilt upright, and then they would um, join it to the booster rockets. Um, this is now um, where the Artemis Orion program is going to be built. So those the holes in those pieces of concrete there in the slabs are where um, you, they will be putting the the, the, the main central um, liquid fuel and then the side ones are where the, um, the solid fuel boosters will go. Uh, and it's also designed that they can use other rockets in there as well. So those slabs can come out and they can put in a different program. So NASA is very good at recycling. They are extremely mm -hmm. good at using technology and facilities they've already got and then adapting it for their new program. You know, as I said, this was built for Apollo. Um, and it's now being built for the next, you know, program, which will be at least a sort of ten-year, um, ten-year program. So, yeah, they're they're pretty incredible. And to see this inside there, when that was built, it was the largest single atrium building in the world. And I we managed to get up on the roof. Um, they took us up there just so you can see, and you can see right across. Um, it's like a sort of wildlife reserve down there. Um, well, it is a wildlife reserve down there. Um, and you saw all the way across to pad 39 A and B where the Apollo rockets were launched and where the SpaceX lo rockets launched from now. It's amazing. Actually, uh, Tim is just uh, flagging in the chat that we are already over time, which is no. crazy. <laughs> I know. Oh, I'm right? sorry. <laughs> no, and, and I've also been like completely running out of <laughs> my own timekeeping <laughs> um, because I had, I had so many questions. So I hope we can pick some highlights in the next two, three minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, this is the moment where you go like flicking. <laughs> just flick through really fast. This is yeah. the um, okay, cool. So, uh, well, I guess um, I can probably go through to um, talk about, I mean, this was, this is pretty spectacular. This is uh, the, if you ever get a chance to see a rocket test, go and see it. Because, you know, when a rocket's launched, it goes up and then just goes away. But with a rocket launch test, the, the engine just is there and it just keeps going and going and going. So it's a sort of constant explosion. And I think that actually sort of summarizes the project pretty well. It's, it's just been this one long bang for me. It's been incredible of, of just a, a, a sort of ride of incredible experiences, seeing incredible things and then getting to make a book that um, I've really enjoyed making and is being pretty well received. Um, and then hopefully the exhibition, which will be the next stage. It's like that sort of, you know, a, a group making an album. They, they sort of make the first bit and now we've got to keep doing it. And um, so now, it, yes, let's see if we can get that work out there and, and hmm. see by everyone if we can. Amazing. I love that. And actually, as one thought that came to mind in the previous one was that a lot of your experience lends itself to film really nicely as well. I wish there was a little bit of, um, you know, that story being told of you experiencing it as well. Um, that would have been wonderful. Yeah, I, 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 we did. We did look at it. The, the problem we have we did, is, okay. is time. Um, oh, there was yeah. just no time. So it was just me and my assistant to keep numbers down when we were at the, at the locations. And then also <laughs> there was... Uh, we had to be you were on very specific timelines where you had to be in and out of somewhere. So we would either be shooting at a location from like four or five in the morning till seven, mate, seven or eight um, before it opened up if it was a public building. And then if it was a NASA right. facility, obviously they're they're working. So we would have to be quick. Makes sense. Yeah. Know. Yeah. So it would have just been you running around. <laughs> it's just yes. some poor quality. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Any final highlights as well that we can get through and still squeeze um, in? <laughs> well, I, I guess I mean, I, I, we were talking about the exhibition. There's the sort of yeah. sort of going to show you a little bit about what um, I thought um, would be a really nice. Um, that's that's kind of the idea for the for the print yeah. so that you get a little bit of an idea of, of where the sort of scale of, of, of things. Um, but it's not, you know, that's just in a sort of gallery setting. There's, there's a sort of different idea, but it's, it's, um, yeah, it gives you a bit of an idea of, of this was the, the first thing I thought of. So these shots here were the, were the very first images that I had in mind when I started this project. Uh, and I think finishing on that seems to be sort of fairly appropriate, really. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I love the scale. I just, yeah, this was great. And I wish we could run for like another hour. Yeah. <laughs> I just have so many curious, like intrigued questions um, from yeah. your world. But um, thank you so much for that. And we'll definitely link as well to the website for it because I was looking at it just before. And um, I think everyone can scroll through this and see 
little both. They want more and are hungry for information. Yes. Um, what is next for you? Uh, can we just end on a little bit of, uh, you know, forward looking <laughs> view yeah. um, because we're wrapping up the year and, you know, what is next on your, you know, project and, and horizon? Well, I've got, I've got, um, there are two projects um on the go at the moment. Well, there's, there's, there are five projects happening at the moment. There are 10 small films, and then I've got two projects which are in development, which hopefully I should be able to um, talk about within the next sort of three or four months. That's the plan. Um, they are very exciting projects. So I, I will um, keep you posted on those. And then the other ones, the, the small films and things are in development, they are all in post production. So there's, there's a lot going on at the moment um, and COVID Wonderful. hasn't really slowed it down. It's just enabled me to get on with that stuff more rather than work. Um, so, so yes, it's I will up. keep it going. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's all good news. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure everyone's updated. Amazing. Well, sorry you had to rush you because, um, you know, I know how much work there was in the presentation and it's just been great to talk. Um, so yeah, huge thank you. I hope you enjoyed the whole the whole session. Yeah, no, I loved it. Um, thank you. It's been great. really good fun. <laughs> I know the chat definitely did. And um, we'll see you again tomorrow, actually. We have more streams coming up. So stay tuned. It's our last week. So yeah, just come and watch along live and ask questions. But yeah, huge thanks to you. And um, bye to everyone at home. <laughs> bye, everyone. Thank you.